Okay, you're live. Good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are on this planet, and welcome to our Facebook Live, Facebook Live, sorry, here at the SETI Institute. So today we, got, we are going to talk about exoplanets. And once again, we are going to talk about a young exoplanet, a very young exoplanet. And for this, I invited one of my colleagues that you can see on the other screen, Anthony Boccaletti. Hi, Anthony. Hi. So Anthony is a researcher at the CNRS at the Observatoire de Paris, and he's uh, the lead author of this paper on the discovery of a, an area surrounding a star where planets are being formed. And he's going to show us and tell us a bit about this discovery and how he basically did this analysis and make this interesting discovery. So Anthony, um, you're an astronomer for several years uh, at the Observatoire de Paris, and you have been working on a field called adaptive optics. And maybe you could tell us a little bit more about what is adaptive optics before, so you, you, our, our, our viewers understand the concept of this instrument. What is exactly adaptive optics is, is for? Yeah, so first of all, um, <clears throat> thanks for the invitation and for the opportunity to, to, to present this work uh, to, to many people. So yeah, adaptive optics is really a, a technology which is not very uh, old, in fact, uh, although we are trying to do a very high contrast imaging for quite some time. But um, yeah, adaptive optics is a system which is able uh, to correct for the turbulence um, that we have on the ground, on ground-based telescope. And the uh, bigger the telescope, in fact, uh, the worse uh, it is. So we have to correct even more uh, with a big telescope. And as for now, we people are using uh, on the ground eight or 10 meter telescope, which are the biggest, uh, the best biggest telescope. And, and then for this kind of telescope, we really need a system uh, which are able to correct for, for the turbulence if you want to really observe stars um, with a very high precision and uh, stars with uh, exoplanets in particular. <clears throat> So this adaptive optics you've been using is located on an instrument called, uh, on a telescope called the VLT. I can have a picture here. I don't know if you can see, but there is a picture of the VLT, which is a very large telescope. And you use an instrument called Sphere, or Sphere in French. Um, what's, uh, what's the target? What did you observe? Well, why were you interested in this million of stars? You chose this target and what it is. Uh, so with Sphere, um, Sphere has been designed to, uh, to really uh, observe very young stars, uh, simply because around uh, these young stars, you have planets, and when the planets are young, they are also very warm. And when they are warm, they are bright. So it's much easier to observe them uh, if they are not too faint, because otherwise, if you take a system like uh, the Sun and Jupiter, uh, you will have contrast of like billions. Uh, so you need to face very high contrast and to basically go around this problem, we, we have to observe uh, very young stars. And this is in particular the case of the, of the star AB Origa uh, that we discuss in this, in this paper. <clears throat> so AB Origa is a, is a star in the constellation of uh, Origae, which is the Chariotir in English, if I remember. Uh, it's, a, it's a star which is kind of a young star. We're talking about what, a million years old, billion? Yeah, exactly. One million, yeah. So, One million. so a few million, it's between, it's probably around two or three million years. So, but I would say between one and five, because as you know, I mean, it's very difficult to exactly measure the age of a star. Um, and it's younger than the star that we are usually observing with field, because most of the time we observe a uh, star that are about 20 million years, which, which still are very young, in fact. But this one is as an interest because it's even younger. So if can they you are show us the picture? Yeah, sure. I can show you the picture. Um, <clears throat> the picture of the um, of uh, the press release that Iso has prepared for us. So here it is. Um, In the meantime, I should remind our viewers, wherever you are on this planet, please let us know where you're following us from. And also, please, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to post them on, at the bottom of our Facebook uh, 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 live or also on our Google. We are streaming on Google at the moment. Thank you. Go ahead, show us this picture. Beautiful picture, definitely. So, so in, in this picture, uh, clearly you don't see the star. The star has been suppressed uh, by many techniques, uh, including the adaptive optics, as we just discussed, but also 
uh, we use a mask uh, that we call a coronagraph to block uh, the light from the star. And after that, we have some other processing technique, which are really numerical technique uh, to, uh, to remove the light from the star and to be able to observe around the star. So in this particular case, we are uh, using a technique which is uh, um, taking advantage of the polarimetry. In fact, this is a polarimetric image. So what we see is the light that is polarized by the dust in this disk. Uh, it's light from the star, which is scattered by the dust and it's polarized. Um, and, and the advantage is that the star itself is not polarized. So if you see with a polarimeter, basically, uh, you can cancel the light from the star, not perfectly, of course, but at least to very, very high levels. So you can achieve a very high contrast of 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6, so a few hundred of thousand or, or almost a billion, a million, sorry. So in this image, uh, it's very complex. In fact, it's very difficult uh, to understand what we see. Uh, if you are not familiar with the object. So there's a lot of structure. It's what we call a protoplanetary disk. So basically uh, a, um, a disk in which we have a lot of gas, uh, but also a lot of dust, but mostly gas, in fact. Um, so the star is very young uh, and it's typically um, a system, a planetary system, which is, which is forming. Uh, so we have many, uh, in particular, spirals that we can see here, here, here all around the star, basically. Um, the, the, the field of view is really large. In fact, it's several hundreds of AU in that case to the image to the, to the left. Uh, but if we zoom in, uh, we can see uh, mostly two spirals. So this one here, this one here, they have about a size of like 80 astronomical units. So 80 times uh, the distance between uh, the sun and the earth in our solar system. So what is interesting here is that we have detect some perturbation in this spiral. In fact, when we see a spiral, uh, we know that it's due to a perturbation. So something in the system is orbiting the star and produce a perturbation, which is generating this spiral. So the spiral is in fact a, a wave. It's like a wave. It's like when you throw a rock on the, on the surface of the water and you have ripples. It's almost the same, uh, the, the same effect. Uh, it's a wave propagating into the gas uh, contained in the disk. And so, so we have already seen spirals in other planetary disks. It's not, this is not the new thing. Uh, we also have observed uh, planets around other stars. Uh, we have imaged these planets, not, not many, but a few tens, I would say. What is very new here is that it's in fact this little structure. Uh, which could be uh, almost uh, invisible, in fact, if you are not aware of what you should observe. Uh, but this spiral is, in fact, twisted at this position here. And this is this twist, in fact, that we believe uh, could be due to a planet. Because um, if, I, if I move ahead uh, with the images, for instance, uh, we already had suspicion uh, from another telescope, which is called ALMA, it's a radio telescope, so it's, this telescope is able to observe the gas in this system. Uh, so we see some spirals. It's also a, a very giant telescope with many antennas installed in Chile, uh, and they have been able to uh, detect these spirals. And especially, they also see a peak of intensity here in the distribution of the gas. And it tells us that there should be something here. And this is the reason why we turn sphere onto this, this star to really observe with a much higher angular resolution, in fact, so more, more precision in the image, uh, what is lying at this position. All right. So basically on the right, you can see an image taken two, two years ago with a radio telescope that gave you an idea that there was something interesting in this system. So the spiral, definitely, but also this concentration of material yeah. So you use sphere, which is observing in the near infrared, to be able to get a better image, a better resolution, better contrast. And that's the image we see on the left. And you, this image confirmed the existence of this cluster. We're going to go back to this cluster. But before this, I want to, to thank the people following us right now and what, look, uh, watching us uh, from Colombia, from Netherlands, from Michigan, from San Francisco, like me, from Glasgow, then Scotland, from Denmark, Kansas City, uh, Manila in the Philippines, Athens, Alabama, Arkansas, Oklahoma, India, Seattle, Brazil, Belgium, 
Woodstock, Illinois, and Washington, D.C. So don't forget, if you have any questions, Anthony is here to answer to your questions about the formation of this uh, planet and what we, we learn from this amazing image and amazing, amazing observation. So now we know we have a planet here. Are we 100% sure about this? Or that's something we infer from mm. multiple observations? Uh, yeah, not yet. In fact, I was coming to this point because uh, um, as I said before, we, we, we have already images of other systems with spirals, we have already images with planets, but, uh, and we know that the spirals are induced by the planet, they are generated by planets. We say they are launched by planets, in fact. But we never made the connection in the same image. We never seen an image where we have the spiral and the planet producing the spiral. So that would be very interesting to get this kind of image, because then we will have a very firm confirmation that it is indeed a planet producing the, the spiral. And why it is interesting, it's because we this is the way planets are forming and, and we never watch this kind of thing. We never seen a planet forming. So here, uh, if I come back to this, this, uh, this, this uh, cluster, as you said, and I go ahead, um, it's another image, exactly the same, uh, the same data, basically. But what we put here in the image is a model of the spiral. So we see this green line and this green line is really following the spiral very well. So this part is, is just a, a spiral arm, uh, as we see usually, but this part is really new. And this is where the spiral is twisted. And we believe that if the spiral is twisted, it's because something is perturbating this, this location, the gas. And in fact, the theory of planet formation uh, indicates that if you have a planet orbiting in the, in the gas uh, around the star, it should generate a spiral going outwards of the orbit and inwards also. So in fact, we have the connection of two spirals at this very location. And this is why we believe uh, it's a planet uh, actually forming uh, at this location. So, and, and, and in fact, the, the, what, is, what was very surprising to see uh, when, when we discover the images, we process it, etc., uh, we were very exciting because in fact, it's very difficult to match uh, a, a model like this one, the green line, with the images. I think it's the first time we do such a perfect uh, matching of a model, which is not a very complicated model, in fact, uh, with, uh, with images. So that's really something uh, very nice to see. Thanks. So we have questions already and uh, questions related to this. So from this, uh, strict, from this model, the green line is basically a dynamical model, I'm assuming, which take into account uh, fluid dynamics and uh, gravitational between. What's, what's, the, what's, the, the, what's the physics behind this model? So, so it's not an hydrodynamical model because it would be too complicated to generate uh, such models and try to fit this model to images uh, because these models are, well, long to compute. Uh, they have several parameters. And the more parameters as a model, uh, the more difficult it is to fit an image. So this one is, uh, in fact, a kind of um, linear um, version of a model, um, which is just, in fact, a formula. It's, it's really analytical. Okay. Uh, so you have an analytical formula which describe this green line, and you just uh, fit this, this model to the image. It's not even a perfect fit, in fact. It's, rather qualitative in terms of fitting, um, but it has not too many uh, parameters. And that's what is interesting so, because with not too many parameters, you can fit the image. Do you have as a parameter, is the mass of the planet is, a, is one of the parameter? Well, that's a very good question because unfortunately, no. Because <laughs> right. that's this a question we, we had from uh, Richard Grohler, in fact, was asking if that's a rocky planet or Jupiter-sized planet. Mm -hmm. Do we know the mass of this planet? We have an idea. We don't know the mass um, just like that, just by the model of the spiral. We need to uh, do something else. And what I did here is that I assume, well, the, the planet is not visible. I just want to clarify this point. It's not visible in the image. We saw the impact of the planet onto the gas. Uh, but what we can say is that if the planet um, emits some light in the infrared, because we are observing in the infrared here, uh, then it's probably surrounded by a circumplanetary disk. That means around the planet, there is a little disk of gas and the gas is falling onto the planet and make the planet growing, basically. Mm -hmm. So if you have this kind of disk, 
the disk itself produce an emission in infrared and you should be able to see this emission. So from this, the measurement of the, of the flux in this area, we can infer a sort of a upper limit to the mass of the planet. And we figure out that it should be around 10 mass of Jupiter. Okay, then that, and that's an upper limit. So it could be a Jupiter sized planet for me. Yeah, but, but then it cannot probably be uh, something much less massive because otherwise the spiral would be almost invisible. So, so that's, you, you answered ask, the question of Rock Howard from, uh, who was asking, if, are, are we sure that this is not another star, a binary system? So we're sure so that that's this is a not very good other. point. I, I would like to, to just to, 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 to comment this point because it's, it's a very interesting question. Just a few days after uh, we put this paper um, on, I mean, on, Astro, on, uh, on archive and uh, after the press release, another paper came out. And in fact, they studied the same object not with this data because they didn't get the sphere data, they used ALMA data, so images of gas. And they, from, from, the, from the shape uh, of the spiral and from the contrast of the spiral with respect to the disk, uh, they calculate a position of the object, which is exactly the same as us, but with a different mass. Instead, they predict that the mass should be a star, uh, only a quarter, time, a quarter of, the, of the mass of the central star, in fact. So that's very interesting, in fact, because we see how difficult it is from this kind of image to infer something about uh, the object which caused the perturbation. So from the sphere image, it seems like uh, it should be a planet. But if we do a different model, if we do a different assumptions, then we can get to a different conclusion. And then it would be a, a rather a star. The, the point is that if it were a star, uh, it's very difficult that, uh, I mean, it's very difficult to understand why we don't see it in our sphere images. In fact, it should be bright and we should see bright, it. Yeah. Uh, so my guess is that uh, it should be much fainter than a star, much lower, sorry, in mass than a star. But, but I, th I, I think it's, it's very important to, to clarify that we are not completely sure uh, that it is a planet. Yeah, this is... To explain this again, this is uh, to our viewer, this is truly the cutting edge of what we can do at the moment to image planetary system information. I mean, we just, Sphere is like four years old, I remember. Yeah, five, five, years, five years on the sky yeah. now. And that's the first observation of this of star with the Sphere instrument using a very special mode in the near infrared and, and so on. So we have one image. So from this image, we start inferring information, but of course, science evolves over time because we're gonna get better instruments, we're gonna get more uh, spectroscopic analysis, more colors. And from this, we will probably know whether or not this is a truly a planet and probably infer more about this planet, like the size possibly, maybe this orbit as well. So right now, it's a, you, the orbit is typically, the separation between the, the protoplanets and the star is what? 18 uh, AU? 30 AU. 30 AU. 30 AU. So it's, so it's Neptune, Neptune in the solar system, basically. Okay. Yes. Uh, so that's mean that in a few years, you, if this is true, orbiting following Keplerian, we will see a motion of this. Feature, well, right? in fact, it's already, um, of course, we are not able to compare two sphere images because we don't get two uh, epochs of sphere, but we have ALMA. Uh, and ALMA, if you look at the position of this peak, it's not exactly at the position of this peak. There's a slight offset of about 10, 14 degrees uh, in angle. And this is about what we expect from Keplerian motion of a planet, in fact. Um, so it's going the right direction, except that, I mean, Comparing ALMA images with sphere images is not straightforward because we don't look at the same light. Uh, mm -hmm. It's um, submillimeter versus uh, infrared, and we don't see the same thing. Uh, and also, we don't have the same resolution, angular resolution, I mean. So we need more observation of this sphere to make sure that this object is rotating at a speed uh, which, which uh, correspond to a uh, Keplerian orbit. So uh, we have question, a lot of questions, in fact. I have some questions. One question from Rob, uh, Rock Howard, who is asking if the spiral structure suggests that the planet could migrate in or out. I think you already mentioned. Are, are, we, seeing migration, are we seeing migration? Or can we infer there is some kind of migration of the planet 
in, around the star, which is not a purely Keplerian, or is not yet possible? Well, I think it's too soon to say because it would it would take probably a lot of time for the planet to migrate uh, towards the star. It's not like in one orbit that that the migration is is taking place. It takes several orbits to 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 move to the stars uh, towards the star. Sorry. So, so we would need many orbits before to figure out if it is migrating or not. So we have a question from Richard Groner who is asking, we mentioned that this could be a planet. You mentioned that the paper, may, there is a paper published at most of the same time that in fear that it could be a star, but based on the ALMA data only. What about a brown dwarf? Since we said that the mass is 10 times the mass of Jupiter, could this be a brown dwarf information? Yeah, at the moment, I think it's difficult to say. Um, yeah, it could be a brown dwarf. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we need to find other way to measure or derive the mass of the object to make sure. I mean, if we don't have a dynamical measurement of the mass, we never know exactly the mass. Uh, so, so, I mean, you know. Do we see radial the, velocity measurement inferred by this system? Or is, is because so it's based we, on, we cannot. We didn't look into radial velocity because usually uh, for for very young star, it's very difficult to, uh, to to use, to take advantage of radial velocity because these stars are not stable. They are pulsating, they are, they are variable. And so uh, it's, it's very difficult to measure um, any uh, radial velocity and, and then infer um, a motion of the star around the center of gravity if, if it would be a planet. So, mm -hmm. so um, well, I, I don't know exactly, in fact, what is the, um, what do we have in terms of uh, measurement for radio velocity? Probably we should look closer if they, they, they have already obtained, people have already obtained uh, radio velocities. But I, I, don't, I don't think it is, it is enough accurate to measure, uh, to, to detect a planet. So maybe it can rule out, it can rule out uh, 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 the presence of a star. Aye. That's so do you, yeah that's that's a very good point so how many stars like this do we know that young and do you, you have plans to observe more of those so yeah so as i said at the beginning most of the time we're observing uh 10 to 20 million years old stars uh this is mostly the the star we observe with sphere in in the in the large programs we are running with the with the consortium uh, but there are other stars which are very interesting and younger. Uh, the problem is that very young star, like, you know, the famous image of Echelto taken by Alma, where you see the protoplanetary disk with many rings, and inside these gaps and rings, you expect to find planets. I mean, this kind of star are not uh, observable with Sir, uh, simply because they are, um, they are too red, in fact. They are, they are very buried in, in the environment, so the extinction, in the visible is too high. So even sphere, which is probably the most sensitive um, adaptive optics, in fact, uh, we, can, we can reach very faint star, uh, but even HL2 is not visible. So in Taurus, in Auriga, there are many stars uh, at 100 parsec, 200 parsecs, uh, which are that young, I mean, like one or five million years old, and that we should observe. And this is exactly why we are trying to upgrade uh, the instrument to be able to observe uh, very red stars. I tell us about this because I want that was one of my questions, of course. I was wait, I was waiting extent. for the question. <laughs> <laughs> so now we, we, we have observed with Sphere for five years, we, we have a good idea of the limitations. And clearly one of them is, is to go to fainter stars. Well, not only fainter, but, but redder. Uh, as I just said, I mean, if we want to go to this kind of star um, in, in Taurus, especially, uh, we need to go uh, redder. Uh, so one of the ideas we have is to put another adaptive optics, in fact, a second adaptive optic inside sphere, uh, which will observe in the infrared to make the wavefront control to correct for the turbulence. Currently, we are doing that in the visible. Okay, so we correct the turbulence in the visible, but we observe with the camera in the infrared. So now what we, want, what we want to do is to correct also in the infrared so we can look at redder star just because they are brighter in the infrared. So for instance, HL2 with, uh, with uh, an upgraded version of sphere would be feasible. So 
I know this is technical, but typically sphere reach magnitude fourteen point five invisible for those who kind of have an idea of this. Yeah. So, yeah, been, yeah. and uh, um, the one you just mentioned is magnitude what invisible? It's fourteen point two. Uh, in our band, HLTO is fourteen point five or something. It's just at okay. the limit. Just, just at the limit. limit. All right, so you're basically going to have a new AO system with a near infrared wavefront sensor, which will be about a lot, which will allow you to uh, do the same kind of analysis in the near infrared within the near infrared flux, which is higher for those very young stars. Mm -hmm. For those who watched the, the the Facebook Live we did last last week, we invited Jason Wong, and Jason Wong basically described exactly what you are mentioning they have they are updating at the moment the cake adaptive optic system with a near infrared wavefront sensor to be able to do this kind of measurement so it's a race there is a race here who's gonna yeah, be yeah, first? Okay, but they are <laughs> yeah. really ahead of us they are ahead of us because our project is not yet approved uh nor nor funded in fact so it's a project still uh okay. which we are trying to propose to eso to upgrade the instrument but definitely uh, this this upgrade on Keck will be done before, for sure. And this upgrade uh, version of the instrument will be called Sphere Plus. Sphere Simple. Plus. All right. Sphere Great. Upgrade, we, we don't <laughs> so know next, uh, in two years, I invite you again to this Facebook Live, and we talk about the first image of Sphere Plus. Uh, well, may, maybe five years. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I will invite you another, uh, for something else before For something that. else, yes. That's yeah. preferable. All right. Well, thank you very much, Anthony. Thank you very much to all of your, our viewers for your questions, for following us. If you, are following, if you are watching us right now on YouTube, don't forget to join us on our uh, YouTube, uh, YouTube uh, uh, channel. Uh, we, we have a Facebook Live like this every week. We talk about anything in space, space exploration. And uh, we have a nice series re recently on adaptive optics and direct imaging of exoplanets. And I hope this is going to continue. So thanks again, Anthony, for staying with us late. Thank you very much for, night, for listening. And I hope it was interesting. <laughs> it was interesting. Thank you. Thank you and uh, we see you soon in two years to talk about another big discovery. Maybe okay, know, good, good. a moon around an exoplanet or something Why even not? more exciting. All right. <laughs> thanks we'll a lot. For you. Okay, thank you very much. Have a good night, have a good day, wherever you are on this planet.